Sharon is going to talk to us about seagrass ecosystems. Oh, you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, I will be in introducing for Prairie and Ayal's paper entitled Seagrass Ecosystems and Significant Global Carbon Stock. Okay, first I'll go over a few basics about seagrass. They attach to the sand or mud based sea floor with their roots. Uh, seagrass are photosynthetic. They use sunlight and water to make ATP, which they then turn into sugars and oxygen. Seagrass can reproduce sexually or asexually. Sexually, the male plants will transfer pollen to the female's flowers. Seagrass are, in fact, the only flowering plant that can live completely underwater. There are about 25 species of seagrass found around the world. Seven of these are found in Florida. These include turtle, manatee, shoal, Johnson's, paddle, star, and widget grass. Seagrass is not only important for its intake of carbon dioxide, it is also a unique habitat for fish and other marine life. Seagrass provide a house and a source of food for many organisms. It also helps to keep water clear by acting as a filter and trapping sediments that go by. This diagram shows how plants pull CO2 out of the environment. Seagrass <coughs> take in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Without their existence, there would be a significant amount of carbon dioxide in the environment. Carbon can enter the sea floor in sediment when the plant dies, so it's not released back into the atmosphere. Carbon also moves through terrestrial carbon input and carbon outflow. Now I'll go through a few terms found in the paper that might have been a little confusing. Autochthonous refers to something that is native, while allochthonous refers to something that is non-native to the area. In this paper, these two terms are used when talking about the organic rich soils of seagrass beds. So some are native and some are not. Next one is DBD, which stands for dry bulk density. This depends on what minerals the soil is composed of and how compact it is. In the ocean, dry bulk density samples are collected by taking pore samples, which I'll go into how they do in a, in a little while. If the soil is dry, the dry bulk density equals the mass of the soil divided by the volume as a whole. If the soil is wet, though, it's referred to wet bulk density. This means um, this will be the mass of the soil plus the liquids divided by the volume as a whole. Dry bulk density values may produce more useful than sedimentation rates for mass balance calculations. In this paper, it says the median DVD of the data collected was 0.92 grams per milliliter. According to a soil quality website, soils with a bulk density higher than 1.6 grams can restrict root growth. So the perfect amount would be 50-50, so there would be plenty of room for the water and air to move through the soil and not restrict the roots. This image shows the bulk density, what it would look like with um, solid and porous spaces. Next term is organic carbon. It can be used as a non-specific indicator of water quality. TOC, or total organic carbon, is a measurement of total carbon plus the inorganic carbon. This inorganic carbon is a combination of dissolved carbon dioxide plus particulates, which can include carbonic acid salts. This study mainly focuses on organic carbon as it has a large impact on greenhouse gas emissions. In the method section, it discusses how organic matter content was found using the LOI, or loss of ignition. In this process, or LOI is a process in which a sample of the compound is ignited in a furnace like this, so all volatile substances are released and the original mass can be found. This form of analytical chemistry usually, it, yeah, it usually uses a furnace to heat up the element. So the steps of the LOI, first they take a 5 gram scoop of soil and they place it into a 20 milliliter beaker. They dry this for two or more hours at 105 degrees Celsius. They record the weight 
and then they heat the oven back up to 360 degrees Celsius, leaving the sample in there for two hours. They then let it cool to less than 150 degrees Celsius. They weigh this to the nearest 0 .001 grams in a draft-free environment to get the total LOI. Some units used in this study are PT, which stands for petagram, PG for teragram, and MG for megagram. Okay, Kenny's going to talk to us about the paper. All right. Thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. Um, and now I'd like to, to pick apart uh, the article written by Fulkerian et al. in 2012. Seagrass ecosystems is a global significant carbon stock. So as has been covered by previous speakers today, um, terrestrial environments provide a viable stock um, for carbon stores. Um, we know this because they extract it um, through respiration um, and store it in in the plants themselves, as well as in the soil. Recent studies have also shown that mangroves are a 
also a viable source of carbon stores, which leads uh, researchers to believe that seagrass meadows may also be, um, or play a large role in storing carbon in the ocean environment. So this study sought, study sought to quantify the amount of organic carbon um, stored in seagrass meadows, both in the living biomass and the soil. They went about this uh, using a few methods and techniques. Um, the first is the ISI Web of Knowledge. Uh, through the ISI Web of Knowledge, they pulled 3,640 data points coming from 946 sampling locations. Um, from this, they were able to get a general idea of how much seagrass area is covered globally, and they estimate that to be between 300,000 and 600,000 square kilometers. They then went about quantifying the amount of organic carbon. Uh, they did this through DVD, LOI, um, and then an analysis of DVD to find the organic carbon content. And so Taryn went through those a little bit. Um, DVD is then measured in grams per milliliter. LOI um, is then it's LOI is then the content after burning, and then organic carbon is taken as a percentage weight of the DVD uh, using an analysis machine. And so, so to get the soil samples, they then went about collecting uh, core data. In total, through the ISI Web of Knowledge, they were able to find 219 core samples that contained either a set value for organic carbon content or the DVD, which then they were able to extract the organic carbon content. Of these 219, 41 of the samples contained this data all the way down to one meter. And one meter is sort of the crucial measurement um, when measuring carbon stock in the soil because it's the most prone to exposure and exploitation. So that's what they're going to focus on a lot here. There were remaining 48 samples, um, which then had data down to roughly 20 centimeters. And so using other data and the data that they had from the previous 41 samples, they were able to extrapolate up to a meter with those, getting a rough number of around 89 where they had data up to a meter. And then finally, uh, just a disclaimer, when for this study, oftentimes you notice they reported the median as opposed to the mean. Um, they did this because they felt that it provided a better representation of the data because oftentimes there were larger values in an area where they had collected more samples. And this will be, this is easier to see in figure two, which is almost entirely bleached out. That's okay. Um, is it okay? I can reduce the brightness if you want. That's fine. I can just use a laser pointer. We'll adapt. Um, so we have the Northeast Pacific, which is going to be right up here. The Southeast Pacific, which follows the western coast of South America. The North Atlantic. The western, or tropical western Atlantic and the Caribbean in there. The South Atlantic, which is the east coast of South America, all the way over to the um, west coast of Africa. The Mediterranean the Indo-Pacific, the Western Pacific, and the South, uh, Southern Australia, excuse me. Um, and so you can see there's quite a few points coming from the Mediterranean, the tropical Western Atlantic, as well as the Indo-Pacific and Southern Australia combined. And so by reporting the median, um, it, again, it shows a better representation because they were worried that the outliers coming from the large amount of data here in the Mediterranean uh, would sort of skew, skew the data. So with that in mind, uh, we'll get down into the figures. Figure 3 is a frequency distribution showing the number of observations of organic soil, or organic carbon content in the soil as a percentage of the dry weight, or the DVD. So the median DVD, um, as Karen mentioned for the study, was 0.92 uh, grams per milliliter, uh, with a mean slightly higher at 1.03. Um, and then what they did is they took the percentage of that and came up with a median of 1.8 and a mean of 2.5%. So if we look, look at the graph, you can see quite a large representation or quite a large observation here in that range. So we would expect to find the mean and the median right there, right around two. And this is just an adjusted, these are just adjusted values. This comes from table one. Um, 
following the estimated values from LOI. What we have in the black there is the actual reported data um, that comes from the cores and the other data points in the ISI Web of Knowledge that had um, set values. So then on the figure four, this is a breakdown of what they found um, in the cores. The black indicates the whole core data. So I mentioned that there were 41 cores um, that had data all the way down to a meter. And then the white uh, signifies those additional 48 cores that was extrapolated from the 20 centimeters. So the one meter cores had a range of 115 to 829 which we can see spanning from right around here all the way to the end. And then a mean value of 329.5, which we can expect to find right around here, which tends to make sense. From the estimated cores, we found a range of 9.1 to 628. So quite a few um, here, extending all the way, quite a, quite a large span, quite a large range, excuse me. Um, so. So for this, we reported a median instead of a mean to, to account for the variability in this estimation. Um, and that median value was 47.2 um, megagrams of carbon per hectare. I should have sort of begun with that. That's the measurement that they're using um, for the organic carbon content, uh, megagrams of carbon per hectare. So then on to figure five. So using the data from figure four, they did a combined median based on the estimate and the raw data and established a median of 139.7 for the soil content, which is, which is denoted in black there. So you can see right there, that's the amount of carbon that they, expect, or that they found in the soil. And each of these dots just represents individual data points. So remember that range from 9 all the way up to 829, you can see that dotting all the way up there. Um, and then the white signifies living biomass. And for living biomass, they found a measure of 7.29 megagrams per hectare of, of organic carbon. And based on the scale here on the y-axis y -axis of megagrams per hectare, you can see that it's pretty insignificant because these range from 30 to 300, and this is only at 7. So, I mean, with a scale, uh, between the hundreds and thousands, it's not even going to show up on that, um, and really only accounts for about 2 to 20 percent of the density um, of terrestrial environments. However, from this we can see that seagrass meadows are extremely efficient at storing carbon in the soil. Because if we consider that only 7.29 7 is present in the biomass, and that 139.7 is present in the soil, that means that about 90 percent of the CO2 that's passing through the plants is then being deposited into that top meter of soil. So in conclusion, we see that seagrass beds are indeed an extremely viable uh, carbon stock uh, when compared to terrestrial environments um, across the land, uh, storing a significant amount in that top meter of soil. And while, this, while a lot of this is based on estimation, um, and there can be you know, doubts concerning how they, they extrapolated their data, you have to remember that they only estimate up to one meter. When they measured in the Mediterranean where they had the majority of their data points, they actually measured down to 11 meters. And if we take just these questionable numbers and apply it to 11 meters, we can see that this number can grow significantly, um, making seagrass beds a, a huge hotspot um, for storing organic carbon. Organic carbon. Thank you guys for your time and I'll have any questions.